right, so the next section I'm gonna do is three two. And this is gonna talk about measures of dispersion. So measures of dispersion that we're gonna talk about are range and standard deviation. And standard deviation is going to then help us with what is called the empirical rule. The first thing we are going to look at here is two different data sets because this lets us, these values help us uh, be able to compare two data sets. So in these two following slides, we're gonna have a list of 100 IQ scores from two different universities. For each university, we will see the mean, that is calculated um, as well as histograms with a lower class limit of 55 and a class width of 15. And then we're gonna discuss kind of what we see. So again, I'm gonna kind of, because it's a lot of data, I will have done this for you already. I would never have you hand type 100 pieces of data into StatCrunch twice to have to do this. All right, so here's University A. Again, there are 100 different IQ values of 100 different students in the university. Okay, we also have University B, totally different university, totally different IQ scores for their 100 students. Okay. What I'm gonna have here on the next slide here is the histograms that were drawn from these two data sets. Okay, so we're gonna kind of discuss what we see here. Note that the mean for both of these is going to be 100. So this is a standard value. Um, the average mean IQ is 100. So it would make sense that in my sample, my mean is still 100 here, my mean is still 100 here. But there's definitely some differences in these two data sets. So take a second here, you can pause my video and kind of look at it. What do you see that may be similar or different? So knowing that they both have a mean of 100, so we've got a similarity there. But what do I notice? I notice that this one is a lot more spread apart. I've got values all the way down to 60 and all the way above 140, where this one's just between 80 and 120. Okay, so this data is a lot more concise, where this data is a lot more spread. And that spread is what taught that same type of word as dispersion. Dispersion is we're going to talk about that spread of our data, okay? So dispersion is a way to measure the spread of our data, and we can talk about spread in a few different ways. Okay, so it says here, both universities have the same mean IQ, but the histogram suggests that the IQs from University A are more spread out or more dispersed. So they can both have that IQ, but the, this university here has a wider range of students. Like some students that may not have as high of an IQ, but then they have really, really high IQ students. Whereas this university does a really good job of picking those middle value students. So there's gonna be a lot less range in ability or in IQ at this university than there is at this first university. First measure of dispersion that we are gonna talk about here is the range. Really easy to calculate. Um, all we're gonna do is take the largest value that we have and subtract the smallest value that we have. So I could uh, go back here to these universities and let's see, I think 60 may be my lowest. Um, let's find my highest. I got a 136. Is there anything above 136? I don't think so. 
So the largest value is actually 141. So our range will be 141 minus 60. Grab a calculator. If you do that subtraction, you should get 81, which means there's a difference of 81 IQ points from the highest to the lowest score. Let's look at this guy here. Um, what do we got? I've got an 86. Is there anything lower than 86? I think that's my lowest. I'm doing a quick look here. Um, so if I miss one, I apologize. All right, highest one. We got a 119. I don't think there's any 120s. I think 119 is the highest. All right, so if we take 119 minus 86, you'll see that these are only spread apart by 33 points. Okay, now again, if this data was entered into StatCrunch for us, it would very easily tell us the range or the smallest and the highest values here. So we can very accurately calculate it. Um, again, I'm looking at all 100 values pretty quickly here to make sure that I think I have the right ones. So we're gonna practice this, of course, with a much smaller data set here, one that's a lot easier to see. So it says here, the data represents the scores on the first exams of 10 students enrolled in introductory statistics, compute the range. And this is the exact same set of statistic uh, test scores that we used in the last video where we talked about the mean, the median, and the mode. So it's that same set of data. The highest value here was 94. The lowest value here was 62. And then we are just going to subtract those two values together to see that there is a difference of 32 points on my test. So the next spread uh, or measure of spread is called the standard deviation. And just like a mean, we can have a population and a sample standard deviation. The differences here is the formulas are slightly different. I am going to show you how you would calculate it by hand but it is a mess to calculate by hand. So please, please, please do not ever calculate standard deviation by hand. The likelihood that you are going to make a mistake is very high because there are lots of steps involved in calculating a standard deviation by hand. So I will always tell you to go to StatCrunch to calculate a standard deviation. Population standard deviation of a variable is the square root of the sum of squared deviations about the population mean divided by the number of observations in the population. That is, it is the square root of the mean of the squared deviations about the population mean. Okay, basically what I just read to you is the formula to calculate standard deviation it probably makes zero sense to you. So I will try my best to explain it a little bit better as to what a standard deviation is. Standard deviation is used to tell us how spread apart our data is from the mean. Okay, so everything we're calculating here is based off of how spread we are from the mean. It's going to give me a numeric value that tells me how spread apart I am from the mean in specific, um, we're going to go to specific points. Range is just highest to lowest, how far is it spread? Whereas a standard deviation is based on the mean. If we are working with a population standard deviation, we use this Greek symbol, sigma. It is a very, very long formula here. Um, and I'll kind of show you how the steps work on the next page. But again, we are not going to calculate it by hand. I want to show you so you can appreciate this, the tools that we have at our hands to help us. What this is saying is we're going to do, this one is 
sorry, this one is the conceptual formula where this is the computational formula. So this kind of works through the concept of a standard deviation. This one is the one you would use if you were going to actually calculate it by hand. I will show you both. They're both a very, very long process. It is not fun to do. If you were using the conceptual formula, you would first take all of the scores and calculate the mean. The next step is to uh, take the difference between these. The score minus mean. Here, score minus mean. Score minus mean. You're going to get positives and negative values. You are then going to square all of those values. <clears throat> so three squared is nine, negative two squared is four. It makes everything positive. And I would then sum all of these. The formula then takes this value divided by your sample size, which is 10, and then square roots the value. So again, lots and lots and lots of steps. Okay, I am first finding the mean, then I am subtracting, then I am squaring, then I am adding, then I am dividing, then I am square rooting. So, so many steps to get a final answer. I will show you the computational formula. So if you are someone who absolutely has to do this by hand, you'll use the next page. Most of you though, I would hope all of you would not and would rather um, go to staff friends, which I will show you in just a second here. Okay. So the computational way to do this, is to take all of your scores, add them together. Square all of your scores and add them together. And then you would go to this formula, the sum squared, which is that 63,000, minus the individual sum, take that value squared, divided by how many I have, 10, all over 10, all square rooted. But again, you'll see there's lots of places you could make mistakes here. If you're square root, if you are not using um, a proper scientific calculator or you mistype a fraction or you put the divide bar in the wrong spot or you miss a parentheses, it's gonna calculate it wrong. Okay, it's gonna give you a different answer than what is the correct answer, all right? It is not worth doing this by hand. Okay, it takes way too much time and it's not necessary. Okay, I don't want you spending 15 minutes on a problem. I want you to be able to get the answer and use it. Okay, so how on earth do I do this? How do I get 9.8 value? Well, what we are gonna do is we are gonna go to StatCrunch. Okay, I have already entered my 10 scores into StatCrunch. We are gonna go to stats, summary stats columns. Everything we're doing here is in the same place. Okay, what you need to know though, is if you are asked for a population standard deviation, you want this. Population standard deviation is called unadjusted standard deviation in stat crunch, okay? So population standard deviation is here. And you will see, I am getting that exact same 9.8 value that they got calculating by hand. We're gonna do another quick example here. Following data represents the travel times in minutes to work for all seven employees of a startup web development company. So it says all seven employees, this is everybody. So compute the population standard deviation. Okay, so I will open my stack run again. I'm gonna hide this one. All right, so employees. This is 23, 36, 23, 18, 
5, 26, and 43. I believe 23, 36, 23, 18, 5, 26, and 43. All right, got it. So because I have the entire population, I am going to go to stats, summary stats on my column for my employees. And I want population standard deviation, which is this guy down here. And it comes out to be, we'll go to two places, 11.36. So after the five is a six, that six rounds that five up. So 11.36, okay? You also found a population. So the population uses the sigma symbol, 11.36 minutes. Next is a sample standard deviation. And the difference here is that instead of dividing by N, we are going to divide by n minus 1. So the formula, unlike these, uh, sample and population formula is exactly the same. Standard deviation is slightly different. OK, so we are using a slightly different formula. And it's a different letter. So standard deviation for sample is going to now be x. Again, it looks similar. Again, I could show you how to do this calculator by hand, but it's really not necessary. So again, there is a computational formula. This is the conceptual formula versus the computational formula. Um, and I could go through and show you how to do it by hand. Um, we are gonna skip by that here. Okay, so, but why do we have this N minus one piece? Why is it different when I have a sample versus a population? Okay, so we call n minus one the degrees of freedom because the first n minus one observations have freedom to be whatever value they wish, but the nth value has no freedom. It must be whatever value forces the sum of the deviations about the mean to equal zero. Okay, so that may not make sense. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an example that hopefully does make sense. Okay, I go, and I buy a half a dozen of donuts, okay? So there are six donuts in a box. The first five people that come up to pick a donut have a choice. They have freedom in what they pick, okay? That last person that comes up, that sixth person, has no choice in what they are going to be. Okay, it has to be what's left. And in this case, it would have to be whatever makes that value zero. That's kind of why another, hopefully an example that makes a little bit more sense as to what degrees of freedom means. It's also because we're working with estimations or we may not have a population value. So anytime we don't have a population value, we're estimating. So when we estimate, we count in terms of degrees of freedom to account for that estimation. All right, so we hope that makes sense. But again, we're not going to calculate it by hand. We are going to use StatCrunch to do that for us. Um, so let's say we have a random sample here of four of the test scores, 62, 88, 77, and 68. And we want to find the sample standard deviation. Okay, so get on my right here. So sample. All right, so I like to go to my page here so I can see my scores. So we've got 62. 88, 77, and 68. This one is just under regular summary stats. I don't have to do anything special. <clears throat> Stat, summary stats on my column. Click sample. And this is the standard deviation that is going to go up here. Okay. It is highly unlikely that you have access to the entire population. So what StatCrunch does is it defaults to the sample standard deviation. 
So what comes up in this table is sample standard deviation. So if you are asked specifically for population standard deviation, you have to go and click unadjusted standard deviation, okay? Because it's not as common to be asked for a population standard deviation. Okay, so for this one, my sample standard deviation is 11.3 right there. And you will see that on the next slide is about 11.3. Um, this is the wrong symbol. I apologize. That should be an S. That should not be a sigma because this is a sample. Sample standard deviation is letter S. So that is another thing that's going to happen in um, Pearson. It's going to say calculate the sample standard deviation. And then it's going to give you two choices, S equals or sigma equals. And you have to pick the right box. So if they say sample, you're gonna click this one and type it in. If they say population, you're gonna click this one and type the value in the box. So you have to know which symbol goes with which example, sample or population. So the next thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna skip that one there, is go to the IQ scores. <laughs> So we already know that the IQ scores had a really wide range. And we're also gonna be able to see that if the, uh, the one with the larger range is gonna also have a larger standard deviation because the larger spread data, if you have a larger range, you have a larger standard deviation. So on the next slide here is a, uh, a printout, kind of just like what we get on StatCrunch here. You'll see your 100. Here's our standard deviation. So 86, 119 had a range of 33. So if I did the range between these two, the range is actually 81. So we see though that still that one is a lot larger spread than the University B data. So the standard deviations are going to be similar. The standard deviation of University A is going to be a lot larger than the standard deviation for University B. Okay, so again, two different values that both determine dispersion, range and standard deviation. The larger your range and or standard deviation, the larger spread you have or more dispersed your data is. The smaller your range, the smaller your standard deviation, the less dispersed your data is. So why do we have the standard deviation? What does it help me with? And one of these things is the empirical rule. So what happens in the empirical rule? Well, first off, my data has to be roughly bell-shaped, okay? Then what's going to happen is my data is going to be broken into three groups. About 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. So if I go for my mean, up a standard deviation and back a standard deviation, I should have roughly 68% of my data. If I go up and down two standard deviations, I would have about 95% of my data. And then third, if I go up three standard deviations and or back three standard deviations, I should have about 99.7% of my data. So, we can do this with sample data. We can do it with population data. It doesn't matter, but both of them are allowed to work. Here's a visual of what I just explained. We put our mean in the middle. We are gonna count up three standard deviations and count back three standard deviations. And then these values up here is what we just discussed. 68% are going to be between one standard deviation. 
95 are between two standard deviations, and 99.7 are between three standard deviations. Okay, so how are they getting all these other values under here? Well, a mean splits my data in half. So if 68% is between here and here, half would be on each side. Half of 68 is 34 and 34. So that is where that value comes from. Next, 95% have to be between here and here. So if I take 95 and I cut it in half, I get 47.5 that has to be on each side. So 47 and a half should be between these two and 47 and a half should be between these two. But I've already got 34 listed. So if I take away that 34, that leaves 13.5 down here. And then I can do the same for the next thing. That's how I'm getting these values, okay? These values are standard for any time we are working with a normal bell-shaped data set. We are going to use the data set from University A. Okay, University A had a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 16.08. And we are gonna answer some questions about it. So using that data from University A, Determine the percentage of students who have certain things here, okay? IQ scores within three standard deviations of the mean. Determine the percentage of students who have an IQ score between 67.8 and 132% according to the empirical rule. Determine the actual percent. And then according to the empirical, we're gonna ask, ask another question. So let's go step by step here. So the first thing you are going to do is if it says you can use the empirical rule is you are going to draw the histogram just like, or sorry, the normal curve histogram, however you wanna call it, like I did back here. Put the mean in the middle, we're gonna go three ticks up, three ticks back. So the mean is 100. My standard deviation is 16.1, okay? So I'm going to add 16.1, go here, 116.1. I'm going to add 16.1 again. That's going to take me to 132.2. I'm going to add 16.1 a third time. That's going to get me to 148.3. Okay, think of it as a scale. I am making a graph and between each tick mark has to be the same difference. Okay, when you create an even scaled graph, this distance is exactly the same. And that distance is my standard deviation of 16.1, okay? So if I increase by 16.1 as I move to the right, I'm going to decrease by 16.1 as I move to the left. So 16.1, so I'm gonna take away 16.1. This tick mark is 83.9. Go back another 16.1 and gets me to 67.8. And go back a third, 16.1, and that's going to take me to 51.7. So that is our first step, is to draw our curve. Question A says, determine the percent of students who have IQ scores within three standard deviations of the mean, according to the empirical rule. Well, according to the empirical rule, if I go three standard deviations back and three standard deviations up, that is 99.7%. One standard deviation, 68. Two standard deviations, 95. Three standard deviations is 99.7. The next question says, it wants us to determine the percentage of students who have an IQ between 67.8 and 132.2. Okay, so I find those values, 67.8, so 132.2. So from the mean, that is one, two back, one, two up. So the answer to A was three standard deviations, 99.7. Standard answer for B is two standard deviations up and down, or 95% of my data.
And those answers are on the next slide here. So according to the empirical rule, 99.7% of the IQ scores are within three standard deviations of the mean. So B, 67.8 is exactly two standard deviations below the mean. And 132.2 is exactly two standard deviations above the mean. So the empirical rule tells us that 95% of my data should lie between those two values. Okay, so now here's where it gets fun, or maybe not so much. They want us to calculate the actual number that fall between there. So I'm going to go back to the University A data. So we want to find out how many actually are between 67.8 and 132.2. So yes, 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 no, yes, 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 yes. Too high, too low. Okay. So remember, there were 100 pieces of data. Four of them are not in my range. That leaves 96 between there. Four are not. So 96 out of 100 is 96 percent so our actual data says that 96 are between here according to empirical rule it should be 95 well that is pretty darn accurate back to where we were here Okay, you'll see here of 100 IQ scores listed, 96 of them were between these two values. All right, so I'm gonna go back here. Um, let's see, the last question was, according to the empirical rule, what percentage of students have IQ scores above 132.2? Well, 132.2 is here, so we wanna know how much is above. Well, above, we've got 2.35% here and 0.15% here. So if I add those two together, that's 2.5%. So be 0.5%. So I know that this, this type of question is usually where people start to go like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? I don't understand this. How do I do this? Let me uh, pull up, let's see if I can find a similar homework example here. So here's our example. Scores of an IQ test have a bell-shaped distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 13. We use the empirical rule to determine the following. What percentage of people will have an IQ score between 61 and 139? What percent of uh, people will have an IQ score less than 74 or greater than 126? And what percentage of people will have an IQ score greater than 126? I'm going to um, okay. I'm going to go back and I'm going to use my basic graph here. So this is where you're always going to start from, okay? And you're going to start with your mean in the middle. So it says my mean is 100, and it said my standard deviation is 13. So I'm going to add 13, 113. I'm going to add 13 again, so 126. Add 13 again, 139. So going back, I'm going to subtract. 13, that gets me 87. Subtract 13 again, gets me 74. Subtract 13 a third time, it's gonna give me 61. All right, so I'm gonna pull that homework question back up here. All right, so what percent is gonna be between 61 and 139? 
Okay, so if I look at here, 61 is three standard deviations back, 139 is three standard deviations up. So that's full three standard deviations, 99.7%. Okay, next one, what percent of people have an IQ score less than 74 or greater than 126? So less than 74 or greater than 126. This is two and a half percent here combined and two and a half percent here combined. So I combine those two together, that would be 5%. And then last one is what percentage of people has an IQ greater than 126? Well, we actually already have that marked here. That's two and a half percent. So two and a half percent. Ta-da! And you are done. Okay, so biggest thing is just get comfortable with this graph here. And know how to go up your three standard deviations, back your three standard deviations. This is the same for every single bell curve we are gonna work with here. Okay, so that is our measures of dispersion that we are gonna talk about. I will see you in the next video.